Okay, we are in Brace for Impact tonight, looking at chapter 5 and maybe chapter 6. The one we're looking at first is topic is endurance. Chapter 10 is a chapter of 10 promises, not necessarily of blessings into our life in the temporal world, but strength or promise of to give us confidence of the future to wait for, as in chapter 10, 10 verse part 6, is the appointed time, wait for it. There are things that God is doing. And we're trying to focus on the idea of having a, a mindset on the, the truth of God and, and trusting God so we can have what we call faith rest, resting in confidence, resting in faith, knowing that things are under control. Even when things are swirling around, or even if we do not understand, we have these 10 promises that God is going to deliver us from every evil attack, that God is working us all these things for good. And even though it may be a bad thing, God is working it for good. And this one right here is endurance, that we need endurance and God is going to help give us endurance. And if we can maintain endurance and just, just keep going, just stay on our feet. It's not a matter of necessarily, you know, winning the victory or having a great game in life, but as much as just enduring to the end, just keep doing what is right. Even though you don't, ha don't see the scoreboard, you, you don't know, what, you know the, if the results are going the way you think they should, you just keep doing the right thing knowing that the endurance is going to take you and help you finish the race that God's called us to. And that's what we have here tonight. We start in chapter, chapter 12 of Hebrews, of Hebrews, and again, we are in chapter 11 of Hebrews on Sunday mornings, and we've been there for a while, and we're going to be there for a while. But someday, in the distant future, we will arrive in chapter 12. But here it is, chapter 12. And as you know, in chapter 11, we're talking about many examples of those who have lived by faith. We've even talked about it here in, in the Brace for Impact series. Uh, some received great rewards in life as they endured and did the right thing. But others had to wait for it in, in, into the future. It's not They didn't receive it yet. And that's what's going on here and talking about that. And then chapter 12 is connected to chapter 11, not just in, 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 in sequence, but in thought, because it begins by saying, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and those witnesses are those that are in chapter 11, everyone from, from Abel all the way through the Old Testament examples, which actually stop uh, in the book of Joshua, and then just randomly gives a bunch of names of other people like Samson and Gideon, uh, and, and continues even into the, uh, uh, the silent 400 years between the Old and New Testament of some potential examples are just listed. These people have all lived by faith or had that faith rest were able to live life confident of what God was doing even in the midst of turmoil. And here, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that we've just talked about, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In other words, Jesus gave us an example. Of course, Jesus' death on the cross was substitutionary. It was a death that... that Re remove the sin it was an atoning sacrifice but here in these verses his life and his death is being used as an example again that jesus sometimes you get in some very uh, liberal churches or what you may want to call progressive churches jesus is a great example uh and that's all but jesus was a substitutionary death for us uh his death wasn't atoning but here also it was an example of a, a person a man who was living by faith and endured terrible opposition, but because of two things that are mentioned here in the chapter that I wrote, but one of them right here in this verse, because of the joy that, not on the cross, but the joy that he, he, he knew, if he would finish this race, the joy that was on the other side, but also the glory, the reward that was not in this age, not in this lifetime, but on the other side, the glory that was to come because of his finishing the race of him doing what god called him to do he was able to and that word is used twice there endure uh and here it says right here again i'm reading 
verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter. We'll look at those two words, author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So in his, when it says joy set before him, that joy was nothing that he could feel. It wasn't, it wasn't a giddy, joyful praise and worship service. It wasn't a joy he could experience. In fact, he was being mocked. He was being scorned. He was being ridiculed. Even the disciples were turning away, and, and they, he was just, the whole world was filled with doubt and question and, and confusion and skepticism. So the joy that he was experiencing was the anticipation of joy. The only joy he had was the knowledge that there was a future, that there was, this was going somewhere. And that's what we're talking about faith. Faith is having a confidence, a knowledge of this is what's happening. This is where it's going. You may not be able to touch it, feel it. Sometimes you can't even explain it, but you know you have this information. And it's not blind faith. It's I know this as an absolute. Jesus knew that this was going to result in tremendous joy, joy that could only be experienced if he endured the cross. And so for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, or the word is hupomone in the Greek. That's the first reference there, or use of the word hupomone. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, meaning right there in the temporal world, it was the most shameful way to end a ministry, a life, a, a, a public figure nailed publicly on the cross for all to watch him die. He scorned that shame, meaning Instead of trying to get away from it, it's like, I, I'm going straight there and endure that because there's something bigger than the public ridicule and the scorning. There was that faith that he knew this was going somewhere bigger. Scorning its shame, he s and sat down at the right hand of, of the throne of God. And then it says in verse 3, consider him who, there it is a word again, endured, hupomone, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary or lose heart you are in the same position or the writer of hebrews is talking to the jews in 63 a.d in jerusalem and we can use this as a model for us you are also facing opposition from sinful men uh, and you are starting to grow weary and lose heart you're losing the faith you're losing the joy that's set before you and you're being overwhelmed with what is right in front of you and you're you're losing heart you're drawing back it's like, don't do that. Look what, Je look what Jesus had to face, and he endured it because he could see what was on the other side. And we have been given a vision of what is on the other side, and that's why we're going through these 10 points of chapter 10. That's what the book Brace for Impact is, is get focused on these things. But this is need for endurance. And it says, consider him who endured such opposition. And when it says consider, that, that is the ideal of, of meditate on this. Look at what he did. Meditate on this. Uh, you could even do the math, even do the figuring of look at what, what he had to go through and what he was going to earn. What are we going to have to go through as we look forward to it? And he had to go through some very serious depths of opposition. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And that is our first reference here. And the things I've got written down on this page, uh, uh, on page 69, on, on your notes right here, is the example of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah is told to, oh, I, should, I should talk about the word hupomone too here in just a moment. But Jeremiah is told to, uh, 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 he, he's fainting. He's come, not fainting, like passing out, but he is losing heart. Jeremiah is facing extreme opposition and again without going into it it is interesting to see how Jesus ministry in 30 AD para paralleled Jeremiah's ministry say in 620 615 605 BC Jesus was coming to the beginning of the fourth generation in 30 AD and by 40 years later 70 AD the temple was burnt Jeremiah came at the beginning of the fourth generation and for 40 years told the people, no, 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 stop, 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 turn back, turn back, turn back. He was mocked, ridiculed, misunderstood, put in stocks, all kinds of problems. And eventually at the end of his 40 years of ministry, 
there was then the destruction and the burning of the temple. So Jeremiah prophesied, and it ended with Jerusalem and the temple being burned. Jesus prophesied, and in 40 years it ended with the temple and Jerusalem being burned. And they had similar ministries. Uh, Jesus even copied uh, some of Jeremiah's messages and used some of his references on the Temple Mount. And so Jeremiah would have been another example. Of course, we know Jesus was the Son of God, but uh, operated as a role of a prophet. Jeremiah was a mere man. Uh, But there's times where he was complaining to God that he was having a hard time, and God is going to tell him, uh, if, if you've run with men, if you've raced against men, on smooth paths we just say a road and you have been worn out how are you going to be able to race against the horses in the thickets of the jordan and so instead of just running against men where he's been worn out god says this is just you haven't even seen the difficulties because jeremiah was getting weary he was wearing down prophesying and teaching and trying to get the people to turn back to god and people were opposing him and yet there was still a full functioning economy in jerusalem the priesthood was still operating on the temple mount they may have been saying jeremiah you're not welcomed up here on the temple mount and they're rejecting him and he'd have be publicly ridiculed and stuff and he was saying how bad is this this is not fair and god's saying whoa jeremiah if you are wearing yourself out in safe country you're running on a road against mere men. What's it going to be like when you actually are going to run against horses through the thickets of the Jordan? Now, there wasn't going to actually be a race, you know, a cross-country, off-road race that he's going to have to run against horses. But he was going to meaning things are going to get a lot worse. And I think running against the horses through the thickets of the Jordan would represent what are you going to do when your city is being burnt bodies are laying in the street and people are being taken away in chains what are you going to do then and you've got to keep speaking the truth even if you're fainting now jeremiah you're you, there's a long ways to go before this thing hits rock bottom and if you're bailing out now uh and understand jeremiah is the prophet we know and I think you can see within there, there were other prophets. Some of them were f- clearly false prophets. One of the prophets was prophesying along with Jeremiah. He fled to Egypt, and the king hunted him down and had him killed. And Jeremiah was told, if you flee, uh, you, I-, I can't promise you your life. You will perish. But if you stay here, I guarantee you will not die. And also we know Jeremiah was prophesying alongside of, in the Bible, Zephaniah and Habakkuk, We're also prophesying alongside Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, when we see Jeremiah, we do not need to think that Jeremiah was the sole man of God in Jerusalem. Jeremiah was one of several. We don't know the number, but we can put Habakkuk in there, and we can put Zephaniah in there. And there are some other prophets mentioned in the book of Jeremiah uh, that some of them had just flipped over to becoming false prophets they just simply sold out to the culture and they prophesied against jeremiah uh other prophets try to stay true but eventually ran away because of the persecution we could throw ezekiel and daniel in there because daniel was a young man who heard jeremiah and was taken in the 605 captivity and ezekiel was a priest who was taken in the 597 captivity so you've got jeremiah daniel ezekiel zephaniah and habakkuk and so jeremiah is just the one that we have a record of his personal conversation with god where he's wearing down and god is telling him if you've been just in a normal setting and you've got some opposition and you're ready to quit and everybody's treating me bad no one understands my message it's like jeremiah what are you going to do when things get real hard are you going to run away like the other prophets and so jeremiah was being called to have endurance and that's what is just i mentioned that here in uh in the uh that second paragraph and then jesus himself said uh you know the cross would have been jesus race that he was running according to hebrews and jesus says if anyone would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me and i think we could use the word cross the illustration of a cross and running the race jeremiah was to run a race The writer of Hebrews talks about let us run the race set before us. He could just as well say let us bear our cross, same way running a race, uh, that we're to bear. And Jesus, we are not, he is not telling all these 
the, his disciples that they were all going to go to a cross. That's not the, all, that's not the way into heaven is you've got to die on a cross. But that cross represents his ministry that God called him to. We've all been called to do something, and it's going to involve uh, some kind of opposition, some kind of need for hupomone. And hupomone, uh, if you look right here, uh, the bottom of page 69 there, the word is used twice in Hebrews. It's used for endurance, run with endurance, or Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3, and endured, endured the cross. Uh, the word hupomone means remaining behind and a patient endurance. That's what the word means, a patient endurance. Again, a patient endurance, not just, you know, I'm enduring, but a pa we could say a, a, an endurance in faith rest, a patient, you know, uh, Philippians. Faith rest would be similar, I would say the same thing as the peace that passes understanding. When all these things are going on, you have a peace that passes understanding. It's not like this, this drug state you're in and you're just oblivious. It's like, no, I have information. I have knowledge of the Word of God and what God's plan is that passes all understanding, all mathematics, all philosophy, all logic, because this is what God, you can't find God, interview Him, ask questions. You can't measure it. But God has a plan for the future. God is turning all these bad things into good things. Everything's moving us towards the goal. With that understanding, say, well, that doesn't make sense. Correct. It doesn't make sense in your temporal world. But it's a peace that passes that understanding, or we call it faith rest. And so... That's what patient endurance is, is hupomone is that patient endurance, being able to patiently endure. Not frantically, not bitterly, not reluctantly, but patiently. No, I, I've got this, and, and endure. Jesus, would, of course, on the cross, uh, I mean, the guy's nailed on a cross, and yet he's carrying on conversation. You can tell in the references there, he's quoting Scripture. He's quoting Scripture, not to the crowd. He's not preaching to the crowd. He's quoting Scripture for himself. He's talking to the thief on the cross. We would say he's winning a soul. You'll be with me today in paradise. The thief says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He says, you'll be with me because we're heading to paradise right now. We're on our way to the underworld. Paradise was in the underworld at that time. He says, you'll be with me in paradise today. Uh, he talked to John. He says, John, take care of my mom. Mom, stay with John. You can see that conversation there. And so there's many things. He's not frantic, screaming out, my God, my God, what is going on? Although at the 12 o'clock point right there, he continues to quote Scripture and goes into Psalms. And maybe at that point right there, after at the 12 o'clock mark, he begins to really experiencing the, the, the payment for sin, of the, or the, the wrath of God being poured out on him because he does quote some scripture there that gives, him the, gives the impression that he's going into a state of darkness, of not understanding. But what he does, he continues to quote scripture, holding on to what he knows, even though he appears to be in a very, very dark state right there, which would make sense because he's paying for the sin of the world. And just in passing, I think when he says it is finished, he had finished paying the sins. It was at that time on the cross. If he suffered for the sin of the world, it's on that cross during that six hours, and I would suggest possibly, especially the last three hours, uh, but when he says it is finished at three o'clock, uh, if it be our time, that is, that it's done. He says, into your hand I commit my spirit, and, and the price has been paid, and he goes into the underworld. Uh, he went, like in the Apostles' Creed, oh boy, I don't want to go down this road. In the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell. And so you get the impression, and I, as a kid, I used to read this all the time. Every Sunday they'd read it. We, I'd read it, quote it. Uh, he descended into hell, and that gives the impression he descended into hell where he's going to continue to suffer. Now, again, you can play that if you'd like to uh, but, and think about it, but that really means he descended into Hades. Just like he told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paradise was in Sheol or Hades, and they were descending into the underworld where the righteous go upon their death and wait for the Messiah and the resurrection or their ascension into heaven. And so the word, in the, a lot of times it, it, in the English coming out of the Greek, uh, 
uh, the word for Hades or the word for uh, Guiana, uh, they get translated hell. But Guiana, lake of fire, Hades, Sheol, paradise, they're, they're different things. They're, they're different parts of the underworld. So in our English translation, he descended into hell. Oh, he must have been being tormented and in fire and oh, screaming. And, and that, that I understand why people would go with that. But if you read the text of Scripture, he didn't go, I would say, he didn't go and suffer in hell. He died as a man and went into Hades. His suffering was on the cross. Again, that's a point of doctrine you could continue to think about and talk about. And I do not want to be wrong on that. If I've made an error, I'd like to be corrected. But the guy thing, I think when he says it is finished, I mean, if he says it is finished, it, it means finished. It, it's the ending of a war. It's, it's the ending of a work. It's finished. It's it's the redemption's been paid. So, nonetheless, he endured the cross. And so right here, hupomone means patient endurance. The idea of this word is this right here, number one, to hold your ground. So when we talk about holding your ground, understand there's a little bit of a different picture there of winning the victory and just holding your ground. You have a place in life, you have a, a calling in life, and part of that is, of course, you want to advance and have victory, but part of it is just don't give up this ground. This is your life. This is your soul. Don't give it up. Hold your ground. Hupomone, it means to hold your ground. Endure, and in this case right here, in your soul, hold your ground. Do not give way to the culture. Do not give way to false doctrine. Do not give way to mysticism. Hold your ground right here. Uh, in your soul and it's like well and, and where are you going well i'm not going anywhere i'm staying right here so there's that part of advancing and spreading the gospel and growing and maturing but there's also this part right here in hupomone of i'm not retreating i've taken ground i've established myself as having faith in christ i believe the word and now i'm just going to stand here and continue to the end of my life to trust christ to do what's right it's like well what's happening I'm hoopamoni. I'm, I'm standing. I'm enduring. I'm holding my ground. Uh, and then the other part, it, besides to hold your ground while everyone else has retreat. Every, and again, that word, to hold your ground, has with it the idea that it's not easy because everyone else is retreating. You can imagine that in our culture, how things are deteriorating. If you're just standing at this point of faith and confidence in this reality of the Word of God, you don't have to go anywhere, and you're going to be at the front of the line. It's like, are you advancing? Uh, well, no, but everyone else is retreating, so it looks like I'm advancing. As everyone's running this way, I'm just standing, and you're moving to the front of the line. Uh, and the second one, it means to continue under the lo load, continuing to work until it is finished. Just like Jesus endured the cross, hupomone, he held the load until he could say, it is finished. And there's a day coming in all of our lives where we'll be able to say, it is finished. You'll enter into God's presence and it will be finished. And we want to be able to endure hupomone until we get there. And that means not retreating, not giving up. It continues to talk here and right here in this section. Uh, it, it talks about, I right there, despising the shame, the temporal situation that was crushing on, on the, the strong tower of Jesus' soul, he endured. He, they was trying to crush him. If you can imagine the, the, the critics at the foot of the cross, all the situation, the whole public turning against him, the priesthood, the Romans, the public, uh, he, he was not crushed by that. He could have given up his soul very easily. If everybody turns against you, how easy would it be to give up? But he had a strong tower. We'll talk more about that later as the book goes on, of having a fortified soul, a tower in your soul, a fortified fortress of information, of knowledge that you will not give up. And you'll hold on to that even while the storm is raging against you. Jesus endured the shame of the cross because in the fortress of his soul, he had the knowledge of God that continually revealed to him the fullness of joy that awaited him on the other side. Uh, and Jesus' example is, is for how we face difficulties as we continue to focus on, again, the joy and the glory that is ahead of us. Now, it, I said we'd look at this verse here a little bit in passing. Uh, in chapter 12, again, of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, referring to those in chapter 11, let us throw off everything that hinders 
and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us whatever god's called you to do and we're all different god's got where god's got a, the same plan of salvation but as far as which where we're going and how we're serving and what we are enduring what ground we're holding to that that's different for all of us that's you part of that's your gifting but then it says let us fix our eyes on jesus and it identifies him as the author and the perfecter the author that's the niv uh the author and perfecter i should read the ni or the english standard here at the top of the page right here the author and perfecter uh it says in the english standard version the founder and perfecter so one of those is the same perfecter uh jesus is the author is one of the words and perfecter perfecter author or founder is the english standard version the word that is used founder author and this word is from the Greek, and you've got it written down there in your notes for you. Uh, it's arch, 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 agos, right there, arch, agos. And this is kind of important. I don't want to waste too much time on this. It's a compound word, arch. It, it comes from the RK. A R and this is, you see this in different place in the scriptures. It means uh, the first. It's sometimes used when it talks about the rulers and authorities in heavenly places, the beginning, the first, the rulers, the top rulers. But the first, and this is a go right there, and that means to lead. So when it says translated author, it'd be the first to lead or founder. Often translations use uh, the word pioneer, uh, the, the, the frontiersman, the one that goes. He's the one that is going first and is leading. He is the one who's, and this is important because he is the one that's blazing the trail or clearing the trail. Uh, he's clearing the race course. Think of a cross-country run over, over you know, off-road race. He's making the trail, but not only making the trail, he's then running the race and not just running the race, he's winning the race. And now that he's the, the, the first to lead, the, intent, the ideal is there, there's people following. He's not just making a trail for himself. He's making a trail that others will follow. He's the first one down the trail, but he's leading something. There's something following him, and that's us. And we're following his running. We're following his winning. And so the idea there with this word hupomone is the trails been cleared he's already ran the trail he's already won the race now it's your turn the only thing that is needed is you need to hupomone you need to endure you got to keep running and just because you're getting tired here and you you've had some discouragement here and some people have have discouraged you this way or whatever your excuse is it's like it's going to get tougher. You're going to have to build up your endurance if you're going to finish this race. And you know that as a Christian, if, if you quit the first time you had opposition, uh, you would have quit right away. But you, you continue, and sometimes you, you're, you're learning, you're growing, you don't understand all the, you know, it's like, why did I get that opposition? Well, I know I've gotten opposition for being a Christian just because it wasn't really me being a Christian. Was, I was being a dork. I was being a jerk. I was being obstinate. I was being difficult. It's like, well, you're just opposing me because of my Christianity. No, you're acting like a social moron. It's like, oh, and, and then you make some adjustments. So sometimes you get opposition, and sometimes you're just a dork. You know, and that's, that's, that's just the facts. You know, and everyone says, well, it's because I'm a Christian. No, it has nothing to do with your Christianity. If you were a Buddhist or an atheist, we'd treat you the same way. It has nothing to do, you're acting like a, a, a jerk. Now, that's not the idea. That's, not, that's another topic here. But as a Christian, you're going to run into opposition. But endurance, as we're going to read on here, this is not a gift. The, the, the hupomone is not one of the spiritual gifts or it's not one of the spiritual fruits. It, it is something that is developed. I'll show you. Both Peter and James refer to this. And the only way you develop endurance or hupomone is to go through situations. It's no different than 
uh, running. The only way you build up endurance running, uh, yes, you could have some genetics. You can be born with, a, 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 you know, different features that make you, you know, lighter or heavier or stronger or something. But how you build up your endurance is you're going to have to practice. You're going to have to run some races. You're going to have to do some workouts. And this is, I'll show you in James and Peter, that is exactly what life is. God is using life to develop you into the image of Jesus Christ. He's using life to transform you into his image. And he's using life along with all that to help you build up endurance so you can finish the race he's marked out for you. I mean, sometimes we think that, and again, there is, there's so many, when you look at these things, there's different sides of it. God has put us here that we might enjoy life. The, everything sh- that God created is to be enjoyed. He tells Timothy that. Paul tells Timothy that. But at the same time, it's not just about enjoying this life. This life is to help us be transformed in, a, in Jesus' image, which is going to mean we're going to have to build up some hoopamone, some endurance. As we, so we're in transition. We're going somewhere. We're becoming something. We're being changed during this whole experience. And so that is what, this, what we're doing. We're f- and we're following Jesus who has run this course. He's the first to go. He's leading. He's running. He's winning. All we need to do is to follow the author, the English translation, follow the founder, follow the trailblazer, and you also will win the victory. It's, it's already been won. You just can't quit. You just can't quit. You need endurance. And how do you get endurance? By facing opposition and, and just developing the ability to endure. You think about Paul, about, we talked about him last week, being decapitated and being so apparently calm in prison on his way to his death, saying, I've been delivered from every evil attack. Yeah, Paul, you're going to get your head cut off. But Paul didn't start right there. Paul started... He'd had 30-some years of opposition at small levels. At first, it was in Jerusalem where they didn't want to meet with him. Uh, The Christians opposed him, and then the Jews opposed him, and the Gentiles opposed him. He went through series after series of opposition. So now they're going to cut his head off. It's kind of like, if if you threaten me, you're going to cut my head off. I'd go into an instant panic. I I don't know what I'd do. Uh, You know, theoretically, supposedly, I'd have great faith rest, the peace that passes understanding, and I'd do it like a great martyr. That's how I'd like the story to go, but I've never really faced that. Paul had faced it many times, so now when he gets here, it's like, hey, you know, it's like uh, I'm being poured out like a drink offering, not worried. I've run the race. I've finished the, finished the race. I've kept the faith, and now is in store for me the crown of righteousness. Uh, uh, hurry and come to me before it's all over so I can get my scrolls. I've got a few more letters to write. Uh, and say, say hi to my friends. It's like, what, 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 Paul, what? It's like he had developed endurance. He had gone through these things, and so he was a professional, you know, if you want to use the word not professional, it's financial, but he was a trained, uh, skilled person. So he was able to endure. The second idea is the word perfecter, which comes from a word we're familiar with, and you see it written down there, teleos. Uh, teleos, it means completer or finisher. Uh, teleos, it means the, the end, the, the completion. And this is, again, the perfecter is the idea there. It's, it's the complete, the ending. So he is the author, the founder, or the arch, arch egos, the first to lead, but also the finisher, the, the, the perfecter, the completer. And keep your eye on him because you're going to be following his course. You're going to be following his completion, uh, and again, it's not, this is not the ideal of perfect, sinless. This is the ideal of complete. You've run, you, you're not going to be able to live a perfect life, but you are going to be able to complete the course. And this is what this word is referring to, teleos, to complete the end. It's used to say perfect, uh, but it's more about being finished and being completed. So Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And then that next paragraph just says, uh, explains the same thing, basically that point there is we only need to endure. Now, halfway down page 71, it says endurance is not listed specifically as one of the fruits of the spirits, for example, in, in Galatians 5. Endurance is the ability to maintain, I got the bottom line there in that paragraph. Uh, endurance is the ability to maintain concentration and remain in God's rest as we continually trust him. So what we're, when, we talk about, when we talk about faith rest, 
or the peace that passes understanding. I'm going to use the word concentrate. Uh, Keep your mind on things above. Uh, The peace that passes understanding is not an emotion. The peace that passes understanding is going to be able to concentrate, keep your mind on the promises, some of them that we're talking about here, keep those in your mind then you're going to have faith rest you're going to be able to rest in faith you're going to be able to keep your mind on the truth on the promises and you're going to have the peace that passes understanding so concentrate would be a nice way of saying this and the more you get a chance to practice concentrating on the promises of god the stronger your endurance or the better chance you're going to have of staying in faith rest. But you're going to have to know the promises. You're going to have to understand them. And then you're going to have to be given opportunities to face some kind of opposition or difficulties for you to reach in and grab a promise or a statement. It's like, okay, all this is working out for good. I'm just going to keep on going. Well, I, and I can, Tony can tell you how many times, you know, we've talked and stuff. And it's like, I don't know. I'm just going to give up. I, this is not working, especially early on, especially in the 80s when I got into the Word of Faith charismatic where God is going to bless you and God is going to solve your problems and all these, these fluff promises were given and then all of a sudden it's like it ain't working. And the more I pursue it, the worse it gets because it wasn't true. God wants you to endure. He wants you to trust Him, not just... I want this and cry like a two-year-old and they give you a bottle. Now our churches are full. That, there you go. Our mega churches are not mega churches. They're mega nurseries. If they're even nurseries. They may just be a bunch of pagans hanging out for coffee and, and some kind of rock concert on Sunday morning. But if they are believers, the mega churches, they're, they're babes just wanting a bottle. Give me some fun music Give me some friends, solve my problems, don't let me have any difficulties, and if I don't like what you're teaching or saying, I'll just find another megachurch that doesn't talk about that. It's like, that's a nursery. There's no endurance there. There's no growth. Megachurches are fine, or secret churches are fine, if they're actually seeking. But once you seek and find someone, you need to put them into the, the, the school. You need to put them into the the university, the academy, and get into the training camp and get them moving somewhere. But instead, they just keep gathering seekers in the mega churches, the secret churches, they become huge nurseries. And the only thing they want, why is this not working? Here, give them a bottle. They just want God to stop them from crying. If you talk about crying babies in the New Testament, it's Peter talking about like newborn babes, crave the pure spiritual milk of god's word that's a crying baby and how do you satisfy a crying baby in the as a christian you give him the word of god you don't just give them what they want solve their problems most people go to church just so they got someone to share their problems with they got somewhere to solve we're a network that solves each other's problems what what that's that's a counseling session that's that's a that's there's a thousand different groups that can give you we want you to mature well, I don't want to mature. I don't want to go through hard times. Right, you're going to be a babe. But if you're going to be able to concentrate, you're going to have to know the promises of God. And then God promised you, I'm going to show it to you, promise you, he's going to put you in situations. And it's not even like he's going to have to go out of his way. But he will. Because you are already living in a fallen world and you're going to come across situations. If you're fortunate enough, God is going to put you in situations himself. Just say, well, give me an example. Okay, Jesus. The Spirit came upon Jesus after his baptism, and the Spirit led him where? Into the wilderness. Not back to the temples where he could preach and become famous. Into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days while he didn't eat. Okay, if I don't eat supper tonight, you know how crabby I'm going to be tomorrow in school. You understand? It's for the benefit of the children at school, I eat supper and a good breakfast. Otherwise, who knows what's going to come out, okay? Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days, led by the Spirit of God, not eating, and not the bunch of fifth and sixth graders showed up. Satan shows up. And that's the thing, that, that's where 
God took Jesus. So will God put you in difficult situations? Well, not my God. My God would never do that to me. Right, because you've got a pagan God. The true God will put his own son in a situation like that. And I'm going to show you verses. He'll, he's going to give you the truth. Like newborn babes crave the pure spiritual milk of God's word so you know some information. And then God is going to put you in situations so you can tap into that information and practice trusting the word of God and have some hoopomone in situations so that you will now be able to finish the race, have endurance, and finish the race he's called you to. For example, now just imagine, just imagine no one giving you any information, any promises of God, other than God is good, he doesn't want you to have any kind of bad days. I mean, like getting your head cut off, getting put in the prison, getting put in stocks, being crucified, uh, whatever. And situations. If you, God will never put you in a neg- negative situation, and you never have to know any promises. God is just going to feed you a bottle. Here we go. Look at this right here. I write here in the middle of page 71, endurance is the ability to maintain concentration and remain in God's rest as we continually trust him or draw into our minds the promises and understanding that we've been given. James 1, verses 2 and 3 says this, count it all joy, my brothers, this is Jesus' brother, who was the bishop or pastor of the church in Jerusalem up until he got pushed off the temple mound right above uh, Robinson's Arch is today, right where the trumpet stone probably fell. That's where he was probably pushed down. He was pushed down because he was supposed to stand up and tell the crowd during one of the Jewish feasts that was coming that Jesus was not the Christ and was not the soon coming Messiah. And instead he said just the opposite. And the, the Pharisees pushed him down, or the priests pushed him down. He fell all the way down, which is, if you've been there, it's a long way to fall. He didn't die, and so they beat him with clubs. That's how James is going, to, that's how Jesus' brother James, after leading the church, uh, is going to die. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, that's the English Standard Version translation, steadfastness of the word hupomone. The testing of your faith produces hupomone. I'll say it again. The testing of your faith. You say, I've got faith. Here's the information. I believe this promise of God. I believe these 10 areas that God is going to give us a, a, a future, that God is working all things All bad things are going to be worked for my good. I just got to endure and keep going. Everything works together for the good of God. I'll be delivered from every evil attack. You believe that? Yes, I do. All right, let's test it. And he's going to put you in a situation. And it's like, get me out of this. Get me out of this. Why is God doing? Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. This is what we've been. That's why you came to practice tonight. You go to basketball practice. And the coach comes in right here. Well, okay, let's get on the line, start running some drills. It's like, coach, this is a lot of work. I'm starting to sweat. I'm feeling pretty tired. Can we just sit down? It's like, why would you even come to practice? Well, I didn't come to get tired and work out. This is what life is right here. So instead of complaining to the coach, count it all joy, my brothers, that the coach has you running line drills, that the coach is having you work out that he's running you into the ground because you've got a game coming up next week. So count it all joy that you've got a coach. Is that and as a ball player, you do. But as a Christian, it's hard for us, unless you're going to understand the scriptures, it's hard for us to count trials of various kinds as an opportunity to show joy. And it's not joy in the situation, the various trials in many situations. It's not, ah, oh, I enjoy the trial. It's, you know, the trial is producing in you steadfastness or hupomone you're getting a chance to tap into some of those promises trusting god and then endure a little longer than you would have a week ago or a year ago or in my case in the 1980s it's like i'm able to endure more and if you do not have the promises and if you don't keep refreshing yourself you're going to go the way of the world you're going to go the way of whatever you know cultural christendom is doing and you're going to give up you're going to find an easy way out you're going to compromise and you will not be able to 
finish your race. You, you will bail out. And you've got to uh, understand, uh, at least uh, uh, anticipate, that many believers don't really finish the course. They don't really finish their race. I'm not saying they've lost their salvation. I believe you're saved by faith in Christ. But I believe there's a whole process of growth out there for us that many Christians turn and run from because it requires endurance. It requ the very word hupomone means to wait or endure to carry the weight after everyone else has retreated, to hold the ground while everyone else is retreating. Well, who's everyone else that's retreating? It's everyone else that was called to run the same race, but they're like, ah, this is too far. I'm going to walk back to the starting line. Not saying at all they've lost their salvation. It's just someone didn't explain to them or they didn't have the ability or desire to endure. Count it all joy, my brothers, James writes, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know, he says, you know, you've been taught, you know this. I'm not telling you anything. You know that the testing of your faith produces hupomone, or steadfastness. And I, I love that fact right there that says, you know, you know this. Because James was talking to people that had heard him preach before, and they'd heard Jesus or they'd heard Jesus' teachings. It says, as you remain at rest, trusting the Lord, this is my writing, not the scriptures, the testing of your faith will produce more and more endurance, which will then enable you to continue to wait in faith for the Lord even more. Not only does the testing of your faith increase your ability to use your faith, it also proves the genuineness of your faith. Trials, besides producing endurance, it proves your faith. Because you may say, oh, I've got faith. I think God is working all things for my good. Here's something bad happens. Oh, no. And then you bail out. Peter says, if you turn the page, Peter writes. Where's Peter at here? There it is. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice both James and Peter start their book. One of the first things they talk about is trials. Now, he says, Peter writes, now... For a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's look at this again. Now for a little while. And when he says now for a little while, that means a moment in time that moment in time may be your entire life your entire temporal existence or it may be this period of time maybe it's a period of of persecution or some kind of difficulty it's not necessarily going to go on until the end of your life or your whole life it may it may not it's it's a various thing but nonetheless it is at some sense especially compared into eternity a little while and it may indeed be a small season of your life now for a little while and he says if necessary the idea there is it's not it may not be this it may not always be it may, you may not be going through a trial you don't always have to be under fire if necessary you have been grieved by various trials you're you're experiencing it and i'm not saying you're not suffering i'm not you're not going to it's not mind over matter it's not like okay i can endure this it's like you are suffering you do feel the pain whatever it is if it's the stress if it's the disappointment if it's the loss you're 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 feeling it you're experiencing it you uh if it has you have been grieved by various trials and why this is the purpose of it if god did it intentionally or if it's just the result of living in a fallen world. And you can see where God directly intervenes and brings something into someone's life or allows something into someone's life. Or, and of course, that's always going to be the case. But sometimes it's just the fact that you're just living life in a fallen planet. I mean, it's like, who caused this? Why is this happening? Listen, look where you're at. You're living in the age of darkness on planet Earth. The Bible says is under Satan's control. Satan is the god of this age. Why are these things happening? Okay, we are living in a fallen world. You have a sin nature that is in rebellion towards God. Satan is the god of this age. And you are living in a society of other fallen humans, many of them 
all of them have a, a natural rebellious side, but many of them have embraced that rebellion towards God. This is your home. Why do bad things happen? I mean, people think that's a great philosophical question. Why do bad things happen? It's like, if I was God, okay, right, right there, there, you just broke that. You're not God. You, you're not, it's like, so anything, you're not God, so you can't even understand what God is thinking. Because, well, if I was God, okay, you're a created being in a fallen state, so anything that you comes out of your mouth mixed is, is worthless. Because you're not God, you have no concept of what God is, you've never been God, and so to say, well, if I was God, I would. So I can tell you why there's evil in the world. God has allowed it. We are in transition. And God is in the process of destroying evil. Because you say, if I was God, I would not allow evil. And that's, in a sense, exactly what God is doing. God has evil in the world today, but he, is, he didn't just like zap his fingers and put evil in the lake of fire. Evil is working its way out attacking good goodness is overcoming evil and in the end goodness will prevail there will be a final judgment and we'll enter into a home of righteousness where there is no darkness there is no deceit there is no light but somehow we are moving through so god yes god is ending evil he's destroying it but we are in process you just have to be part of the process you'll eventually get to the point where you will be there and God will do what you thought he should have done in the first place, get rid of evil. But you can't just snap your fingers. Okay, here we go. Now for a little while, Peter writes, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to, be, to result in praise and glory. These trials now are proving i don't know if i wrote proved right i'll just write the word proved i right there proving your faith is genuine i can't write genuine i'll just write true you have true faith because if you've got true faith if you understand the doctrines if you understand what god has promised this faith will produce hupomone and when it comes out it's going to end up giving you watch this it's going to result in praise, glory, and honor. And that's important. Because when you have gone through these trials and have proven that your faith is genuine, you are able to endure. You stood the ground while everyone else is retreating. You held your ground. You, you continued to remain in faith rest. You continued to do and finish the race that God had given called you to you ran the race that christ paved for you you finish that it's going to result in praise glory and honor now first of all before we go there this faith right here is worth more than gold even gold that's been refined with fire now in this life you've got you nothing's more valuable we'll just say than gold if you had gold but Peter's saying, if you had a chance to have gold in this age, this genuine faith is worth more than bars of gold. Because when the time comes at the appointed season, at the appointed time, that's where we're heading next, and we'll have to pick that up next week, at the appointed time, this faith is going to be rewarded. This gold is of this age, it's going to pass away. Faith is going to go into the next age, and it's going to receive praise, glory, and honor. And understand, whenever you read the words praise, glory, and honor in Scripture, you think, ah, God gets the praise, God gets the glory, God gets the honor. In this case, it's you're the one whose faith has been proven through trials it's your faith is worth more than gold because in the end your faith is going to result in praise glory and honor that is your praise your glory your honor coming from god commending you well done thou good and faithful servant this faith people want to try and twist it my faith will result in praise glory and honor to god yes okay i'm sure that's going to take place in context here it's saying your faith you don't you don't you'd rather have this faith 
than gold because this gold is going to pass away and this faith will eventually result in praise glory and honor when you are welcomed into the kingdom as someone who followed the the author and perfecter of your faith you followed the course and you finished the race just like he did even paul says when he says i finished the race he says now is in store for me the crown of righteousness he says i have finished the race i've kept the faith now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness in store for me the praise glory and honor for having finished the race that god marked out for me i mean there's no doubt about that what, what i'm saying right there but this ideal of gold faith being worth more than gold here's a, a joke a story i can't avoid saying this there's a guy and this is not a truly christian this is not a correct doctrine but it's a fun christian joke so there's some doctrinal error within this story uh a guy dies and he goes to the pearly gates and peter's there and he's got uh he, he says can i bring one thing in peter said no you, you got nothing can come in everything's got to be left back on earth and again this seems there's huge doctrine right there i got five things in my mind oh, correct that correct that correct that okay just let it go okay and he says he said what what, what is you he said well he says what did you want to bring he begs and begs and says you know he says okay he says what what did you bring and he reaches in his bag and he says i i want to bring i want to bring bring this and peter says pavement he goes no it's a bar of gold <laughs> pavement because the streets in heaven are made of gold the guy says I want to bring this. And he says, a piece of pavement? It's like, oh, right. Our streets are made of gold here. You, you won't need that. So in other words, that's kind of funny. I think I could have told, I think I could have told that better. When you've got to say, you never hear uh, Jerry Seinfeld or Joe, people are telling comedy that that was funny. Then you've got to tell the audience, that was funny, you're supposed to laugh. But it is, you know, a guy that brings, you, know, you understand the idea. You're bringing it up right here. We're walking on this stuff as pavement. And again, that's a whole other conversation that getting into the city of god okay okay always end a good sermon message with a terrible joke or try to save a bad message with a good joke and i didn't do either one uh anyway now for a little while if necessary you have been you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor watch at the revelation of Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ returns, when he is revealed and the sons of God are revealed along with him, you'll receive the praise, glory, and honor that your faith has. Uh, so continue to endure and remain in the rest of God as you trust his word because when Jesus Christ returns and is fully revealed in the reality of his creation, you'll receive praise, glory, and honor uh, from the Lord himself. Next week we'll talk about point six. I was going to get into that tonight. I thought maybe I could rush through that, but I didn't, uh, about waiting for the appointed time. But anyway, hupomone, it is a, the ability to endure. It's a, it's a quality that has to be developed. The promise of that is God is right now in all of your situations. When you brace for impact, what's coming into your life, realize it's going to be used to help build endurance so that you will continue to be able to demonstrate the genuineness of your faith and become more and more mature and endure more and more and hold your ground in even more complicated situations. You may be struggling running the typical race on the road against men, but God is going to continue to test you. Even if even you say, well, I don't want to be tested. Well, you're going to be until you can get to the place where you can run against horses through the thickets and the weeds and the overgrowth by the Jordan River, which is a difficult race. It's basically, a, it's basically if it's Jeremiah's story, going from running a natural race to running a supernatural race against impossible odds one is running against mere men these horses would represent the entire spiritual realm that you're racing against and overcoming because you've you've built been built up so in difficulties brace for impact because the things that are coming are going to help prepare you for a greater level of faith and that's just the the one of the points here in chapter 10. I'll pray and we're finished. Father, do thank you for the chance to look into these things. I ask that we may again understand them, that we may apply them to our lives. We thank you for revealing them to us through the scriptures and allowing the Spirit of God to burn them into our hearts and to reveal them to us that we may understand them and live them out in our lives. And we do ask that your Spirit would speak to us during the day, during the night, that we may be strengthened by your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for your time.